Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miss Music Teacher James C. Smith and Miranda Janelle. Coming up on DTNS, we sum up the benchmarks for the RTX 4090. Summary of the sum up, they're good. Roku's getting into the smart home business, and Microsoft put Dolly 2 into a design app and into Bing and the Edge browser. Where will this stop? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 12th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the producer, Roger Chang. And happy birthday, Sarah Lane. She will return to the show after a, a well-deserved break tomorrow, uh, but she's taken her last day off for her birthday. So happy birthday, Sarah. Meanwhile, we will celebrate her birthday with a few tech things you should know. Apple and Microsoft support passkeys already. Uh, and now Google has announced support for passkeys is launched on Android and the Chrome browser. So that magical world of passkey interaction we described earlier this year is now available if you want to get into the beta. Uh, Google backs up passkeys to the Google Password Manager in case of device lockout. So that's something you should be aware of if you choose to live in that universe. With passkey, when you log in on a phone, it tells you, hey, I'm going to use passkey on this site. Is that cool? And then if it's cool, you... The confirm with however you lock your device. So fingerprint, face ID, passcode, whatever. Uh, to log in on a desktop, you can scan a QR code to your device and then proceed with the fingerprint, face scan, etc. If you want to start using passkeys on Android and Chrome right now, you need to either be in the Google Play Services beta, if you want to use it on Android, and or Chrome Canary, if you want to use it on Chrome. A stable launch is expected by the end of the year, though. So if you don't want to get on the beta, you shouldn't have to wait long. Uh, if you get in on those betas, though, you, as an Android user, could use Passkey to sign in on Safari on a Mac. Or you, as a Canary Chrome user on Windows, could use Passkeys that are stored on your iOS phone. It's a wonderful world. Are we actually talking about a potential present and future where all of these uh, password managers talk to each other and it's just no longer a bunch need, of gardens? Just need the apps and the websites to join now. That's it. I'm that, all into this. That sounds great. Well, let's talk about a couple of those companies further. Apple, Google, and Samsung have announced software updates coming soon to enable 5G support in handsets in India. Phones sold in India have gotten 5G capable hardware before, but there hasn't been 5G service until recently. India's two largest carriers, Reliance Geo and Artel, have launched 5G service in a few cities over the last couple of weeks. Apple's, uh, Apple's updates will come in December. Samsung and Google did not provide specific timeframes. But probably by December. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Netflix has joined Barb, not from Stranger Things, uh, not Scott's old high school newspaper, but a <laughs> nonprofit organization that measures TV ratings in the UK. Uh, first time Netflix has officially joined a ratings organization. Barb will begin including Netflix in its published ratings starting the second week of November, but it's got some things to say about what it's counted already. Uh, Barb says Netflix is the most accessed streaming service in the UK right now. Uh, and even though it lags behind broadcasters like the BBC, it accounts for 8% of all UK TV viewing. Nielsen offers Netflix ratings in the US. If you're like, wait, I thought Netflix did get rated elsewhere. Netflix doesn't cooperate with Nielsen and even sometimes disputes their accuracy. But joining Barb means they probably won't dispute their accuracy, at least not publicly. I was the paper cartoonist, by the way, for the Barb. Oh, That's of course what I did. You were. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Weird, weird kid. The memory chip maker SK Hynix confirmed it received a one-year temporary exemption from new U.S. rules restricting chip-making equipment from being sent to China. The exemption will let SK Hynix supply its own China-based facilities without additional licensing requirements from the U.S. Commerce Department. And expect a bunch of Huawei people to be hanging around outside the SK Hynix plant now. Yeah. Like, hey, uh, you mind if I just take a look around? <laughs> Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo predicts that Apple could supply the U.S. market with devices entirely supplied outside of China within the next three to five years. <laughs> the move would represent up to 30% of its global shipments. This is a great piece of perspective setting uh, from Ming-Chi Kuo. If you're thinking like, why doesn't everybody just stop making things in China? Uh, Apple could do it 30% in three to five years. Supply chains, they're complicated. They're hard to move around. Kuo does expect MacBook production could move to Thailand and that India's Tata Group could work with either Pegatron or Wistron, or maybe both, to expand Indian iPhone production 
to be enough that they could export iPhones. Right now, the goal is to make iPhones for domestic use in India, but India could become an exporter of iPhones within the next three to five years. And they'll have the 5G to match. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And it'll be turned on by them. All right. Let's uh, talk a little more. We were going to have, if you if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that we mentioned Will Smith uh, would be coming on the show today to talk about the RTX 4090. Uh, he was unable to join us. We're going to reschedule that. Uh, but... RTX 4090 still getting a lot of buzz. It's the latest flagship. We mentioned briefly some of the, the benchmarks and, and early uh, reviews out there, but Roger Chang has been digging into those benchmarks and reviews to give us a little more detail today. So Roger, uh, tell us the, what it is, what it does, and is, is it worth it? What do you, what do you found? So a uh, quick review, uh, the 40, RTX 4090 is NVIDIA's flagship GPU based on the new Ada Lovelace microarchitecture. Uh, it is a monster both physically as well as performance-wise, and all the reviews so far have said that the card does live up to the expectations that uh, people put uh, on it. It has both uh, with uh, DLSS turned on, which is um, the upscaling technology NVIDIA uh, uses to get uh, higher image quality out of lower resolution so you keep your high frame rates whatever game that you play. Um, onwards, you're seeing anywhere from 60 to 90% increase depending on the game. Nice. Increase, and, and that's with ray tracing turned on. It gets even crazier if you use uh, our, our DLSS uh, compared to the previous 3090 Ti as well as the 3080 uh, chips. Um, and it is a screamer. It is it, it, so the guys over at IGN, Chris Koch and Bowmore, managed to get Cyberpunk 27, 2077, which is one of the uh, one of the games that allows you to crank everything to a hundred to really kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, buff test your machine. Um, they got 120 frames per second at 4K resolution with all the eye candy turned on, mm. uh, ray tracing turned on uh, with DLSS enabled. So. That gives you an idea of how incredibly powerful uh, this card is. It is it is um, it is rendering things uh, so fast and so much that in many cases you're limited by your CPU. In other words, your CPU uh -huh. is bottlenecking the system because it can't give the GPU enough information to chew. And so, in in one retrospect. If you don't have an up-to-spec PC, if you don't have the uh, high-end CPU, a uh, uh, late-gen motherboard, you might be doing yourself a disservice, even if you want this card, because it, your, the rest of your system can't keep up. Yeah, and so, you don't put a Porsche engine in a Nova, people. Yeah, that, this, yes. and this hasn't been a problem for a while. So hearing this in these reviews is interesting, because prior to this, it was like, CPUs are ahead of the game. You kind of don't need to swap into that out. You can live with this core machine for a long time. Just keep swapping GPUs. That may not be true for much longer, I or mean, when this thing hits. Yeah. yeah, I mean there is a there is a limit to your CPU not being able to support this because you first of all have to have a big enough machine with three slots <laughs> to, to yeah. handle this yeah. monster, so, and you have to have an eight hundred fifty watt power supply. Uh, so likely you're going to have a better CPU if you've got those two things to begin with, or you're building a whole new machine from scratch, right? Yeah, I mean you know, and three slots. Just so you know, it physically needs the three slots plates on the back of your PC, but the fan juts out half a slot in <laughs> over to the right. So technically, it's three and a half slots. Uh, uh -huh. So, okay, good so point. It's, it's a very big card, and the 850, 850 is the minimum, minimum G, uh, C, uh, PSU uh, that they recommend because it does have a max draw of 450 watts, which is a lot. Now, um, everybody yeah. is complaining about this price because it's $1,600. Uh, from what you can tell, uh, if you can afford it, which is a big if, I get it, but if you could afford it, is it worth $1,600? So this is the thing. From all respects, yes. If you have a machine that can feed this beast the information it needs, and you want to do the 4K gaming with all the eye candy, and let's say you got a side business of doing Twitch streaming or, or Adobe uh, After Effects, it's it's actually not that bad. The original 3090 uh, sh uh, released at 1500 bucks when it came out three years ago, and the uh, 3090 Ti initially shipped at 2000 Right. So for $1,600, it's not a bad price for what you're... In other words... For what you're paying, you you are you are getting what you pay for. 
If no, you, whether you're, or not you can... you're saying if you have the means, you highly recommend. Yeah, it. yeah if you have and, the means, you can get it. Sure. And I mean, the, I mean, the, the the thing about these these video card upgrades, there's going to be a big middle pack of players or gamers or even creators who this is going to be overkill for for what you're doing. Um, if you're already enjoying, you know, Cyberpunk 2077 at 1440p and you're doing so at 120 frames per second. And you've just had to turn off a few things here and there to make that work. You're probably not going to be able to plug this in and go, wow, I'm so glad and, mm -hmm. I spent $1,500 on yeah. this very minimal change. Totally. But you, you'll know who you are if you're yeah. getting this. And, right? you know, I'm glad you brought that up. If you're a person that's still on 1440p or 1080p gaming, you don't have a 4K, you know, high frequency, you know, 120 plus refresh rate gaming monitor. It's really not. It's it's really not a jump. It's not worth the extra cost. It's yeah, not. Yeah. It's not worth the extra cost because you're not benefiting from this card's power. And your card already. If your card can already do those, do that gaming at sixty frames plus, I'm, you're not going to see a huge. You're not going to see a benefit to plunking down sixteen hundred dollars. This is not. Everyone should scrape together sixteen hundred bucks. Go drive an Uber uh, and buy one right now. This is. Uh, if you have this set of requirements and this set of existing specs, then and you have yeah. sixteen hundred dollars, it's worth it's, it. That's what it sounds yeah. like to me. And I will add this: as of right now, Best Buy, which is the partner for Nvidia for the Founders Edition for this card, is sold out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. They're going to be a little hard to get at first. Maybe not as bad as the long haul supply chain issues we saw a couple of years ago, but it'll be, you know. If you didn't already get yours on yeah. order, you're probably going to This is it. because of demand, though. <laughs> yeah. Actual demand, just regular yeah. demand. I know. Right. Isn't that great? Amazing. All right. Let's yeah. see if we got a demand for some new smart home things. Why not? Uh, the month that everybody announces all their new stuff, Roku also announced some things. Eight new smart home devices that you can control from the Roku OS. The device includes smart bulbs with white and color versions. So that's cool for those looking for that. Light strips, indoor and outdoor smart plugs, a video doorbell a floodlight camera, indoor and outdoor cameras as well, and an indoor camera that can pan and tilt. Hmm. Actually, I think I want one of these. Uh, you can also control them with Roku Smart Home app on your Android or iOS phone and by voice on the Roku remote. So you can just do that in the house. Roku partnered with Waze, uh, Wise rather, to make this line. So if they look familiar, that's probably why. It'll match the <laughs> I want them I to have. partner with Waze so they can also yeah, do that. Yeah, I know. Wait, I was like, no, as soon wise, as I saw yeah. that, I'm like, I don't know what road's <laughs> the best one to take. Anyway, uh, Roku integration adds some interesting features. <laughs> Uh, if you use a Roku powered TV device, so for instance, the video doorbell can send a picture in picture view to a television and alert you when it sees packages or pets or what have you. Uh, they are not locked down to just Roku, by the way. The devices are also compatible with Google Assistant. Amazon compatibility is coming in early November. That also makes sense because they're partnering with Wise and they already do all that too. Uh, do they support Matter? No. <laughs> Sorry to tell you, Roku is a member of the Matter Working Group, but the devices are not yet certified as Matter compliant. That could change. Right. Uh, the devices range from $14 to $100, and Roku says there will be a cloud subscription service for sorting, or excuse me, storing cameras and their imager, uh, images from the cameras, rather. Uh, there's no price for what that service is going to be yet. I'm guessing it'll be in line with what others are. You can order uh, online or wait for them to show up at Walmart on October 17th. Yeah, so I, this this is interesting if you're in the smart home uh, marketplace. Although you can get all of these things from other manufacturers, <laughs> including Wise, <laughs> who's making these for Roku. Uh, but I think it's interesting that Roku is seeing this as its next step. Uh, so the way I think of it is, Roku made devices and made money off devices until they started to max out the amount of money they could make off devices. Then they started selling services and advertising uh, until the advertising market started to get a, a little uh, thin out there. And I don't think they've maxed out services and advertising, but as that money becomes a little harder to increase, they're moving into smart home, which makes sense. Uh, if, you, if you've got the biggest screen in the house, I think it makes sense to be the one to say, hey, we'll, we'll put some camera stuff up there for you. They're not the only one that could do this, but they are the ones who own the whole system in this case, right? With the Roku OS on your TV, as well as the, the Roku camera. So there, there's a compelling thing for some people like, oh, I have a Roku TV. I'll, I'll get that Roku camera because at least I know it'll work. Now, granted, if they were matter compliant, then they should work with everything too. But you know, the way where our minds work, we'll see Roku and Roku and go for that. They'll probably sell a few of these things. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I see Roku staying in the pack 
uh, mm-hmm. despite inroads made by big companies with big names and staying in there as as a device you can get for your television, a TV integrated with their services, um, this stuff coming down the road. I don't know why. I just like seeing the little guy who was there early stay in it and not get pushed out by Apple and Google and yeah. Amazon and everybody else. So the I'm, little I'm guy who was there, it. like Google, the little search engine that took down yeah. Alta Vista. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't a bad, good or example. Apple, I that just... little upstart computer maker that. <laughs> yeah, you know. those little guys who just. Or Microsoft. <laughs> you know, DeskView was a much better operating system, but that little Microsoft, they, they were all sure, little sure. ones. Is my sure. Point. But I think I think Roku, you know, look, just they're a name you recognize and they've earned it and I hope they do well. I'm rooting for them personally. Yeah. Uh, Beatmaster asks a very important question. Uh, Roku doesn't have a particularly good or bad security history. They really don't have one. Uh, And Wise has a bad one. So hopefully Roku can improve on that. But that's a question. And W. Scott one had a really interesting uh, thought in the chat about like Airbnb owners who have Roku TVs maybe wanting to buy the cameras and stuff uh, for people who stay in their Airbnbs. Uh, If you have thoughts like this or anything about the show, send us an email. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Microsoft announced a bunch of new hardware at Ignite. They also announced software and services. Uh, So let's run through them. Let's start with the hardware, Scott. Right, that sounds good. The Surface Laptop 5 now runs on Intel's 12th Gen i5 and i7 processors. No more option for AMD. Sorry, guys. Hmm. But you also get Thunderbolt 4 and Wi-Fi 6. Uh, The display has a Dolby Vision IQ support. But overall, it's pretty similar to the latest version or the the last version before this one. You can pre-order now. It's available in 13.5 inches starting at $1,000 US and 15 inches starting at $1,200 US. Shipping begins October 25th. Yeah, so that's a very minor update. Uh, Surface Pro 9 and 9 with 5G are going to replace the Surface Pro and Surface Pro X lines, respectively. Uh, The Surface Pro 9 is replacing the Surface Pro and gets the Intel 12th gen processors. And the 9 with 5G replaces the X line and gets Microsoft's SQ3 ARM chip. No, you can't get 5G on the Surface Pro 9 with Intel, only on the one with the ARM processor. That ARM chip is Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 CX Gen 3, but customized by Microsoft to work well with Windows. And by all accounts, it works really well. Both Surface Pro 9s have 13-inch 2880 by 1920 displays, up to 120 hertz refresh rate. The Intel models also add Dolby Vision IQ support. They both weigh around 880 grams or so. Uh, A neural processing unit is coming to the 5G model that can do things like adjust your eye contact, automatically frame shots, blur backgrounds, remove background audio uh, for Microsoft Teams, but also for Zoom and other things because it's happening on the chip. Surface Pro 9 starts at $1,000 and the Pro 9 with 5G starts at $1,300. You can pre-order those now. Also shipping October 25th. Wow, big day for all these. Now, if you're an artist out there and you were like, man, I sure wish the studio was a cooler device the surface studio good news maybe uh microsoft announced the studio 2 plus this has a 28 inch 4500 by 3000 touchscreen display this runs on intel's 11th gen mm. i7 cpu and nvidia's rtx 3060 gpu which is mm. a great card i know we've been you know a little mm-hmm. overshadowed today by new gpus but this is a very fast card with a terabyte of storage it adds uh, dolby vision auto color management wi-fi 6 and bluetooth 5.1 along with Dolby Atmos speakers. Uh, It's got three USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports and can support up to three 4K 60 hertz external displays. You can pre-order this now. This ships October 25th as well for $4,299 or $4,499 with the stylus keyboard and mouse included. They didn't say anything about whether they're including that weird dial puck thing that they had on the initial... Yeah, Surface I didn't see any mention of the dial yeah. anymore either. I, I would have guessed gone. the 9 and 9 with 5G because of the NPU, uh, because of the improved SQ3 chip would be the one that most people would say is the most improved. And, and none of these are, are huge leaps forward. But you surprised me. You said you were inspired by the upgrade to the Studio 2 Plus, and it's using 11th gen Intel and a 3060 GPU. So tell me why. Well, here's the reason. Um, I always kind of, kind of secretly uh, root for the Surface line, all of them actually, to be more creative tool focused. And once in a while they get it right. The Surface 2 way back in the day 
was an amazing stylus pen combo screen thing. And then they changed it. It got weird and latent latency ridden issues and all this. And it just wasn't as good anymore. The first one of these came out, the original uh, studio, Surface Studio, and I got really excited. The screen laid down. You could fi you fire up Photoshop or Clip Studio, whatever it is you're using, and you get your stylus, and bam, your, your big art studio, desktop-based art studio at your fingertips. But it was way underpowered, horrible specs. It wasn't great. So I was like, well, we'll see what things you know may change down the line. As much as people are using iPad Pros and even Surface uh, laptops and other smaller devices, to do this work on now and even wacom's got a few options that are both uh you know some based in linux some based in windows there there's still i think a need for a big i got this whole desk dedicated to my production stuff and i always just think just maybe these studio these surface studio models are going to be the bomb when it comes to that but they always just kind of limp over the line of adequate specs like this is a huge jump over the original studio obviously but it's not a huge jump in terms of some other competition out there. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know that I would say, well, yeah, pull the trigger on this, go for it. I still don't know how that's pen behaves. It was latency, bad latency on the last one. So maybe they fix that. That may fix a lot of things. But I don't know. I just keep hoping that these could be cooler and that they would throw more at them. They certainly charge for them. This is not cheap yeah <laughs> by any stretch so they're actually going for that that kind of price point that people are used to paying for an expensive mac and an expensive wacom tablet and all the bits and pieces that go with it but i'm not sure you're getting that full value here quite yet i still root for it though i want to see one you'll always work. have the parts for it though because that's true very old parts all right now to software and services microsoft announced two design products microsoft designer for the web and image creator for bing and microsoft edge yeah the browser both of these use OpenAI's dolly 2 which microsoft has been the client for uh they they are the ones who are paying to use dolly 2 microsoft designer is a web app similar to canva uh, for quick de designs of things like posters, invitations, graphics, stuff like that. Uh, you can start with text, uh, just describe what you want it to make. The generator will give you an image, and then you can modify it from there. You can also use stock art, user-created art, just like you would with any other design app. It's free during a private preview period and will eventually be included in Microsoft 365, although they'll have a limited version for free for people to try as well. Image Creator is available to everybody for free. It's going to show up in the Edge browser and in the Bing search engine and works like a front end to dolly too you you put in the text you get an image no editing stuff like you have in design but otherwise uh, you're going to get the ai created stuff it'll launch in preview and select locations so they can make sure that they keep misuse down before they roll it out more widely microsoft's also launching a new hub for all of microsoft's design related products at create dot microsoft.com what do you think of this uh we've talked a lot about using algorithms to generate stuff what do you think of microsoft's take on it well i would say to all my artist friends out there and to myself included uh you might see this and go great now i can just they're not even going to use me for their cool flyer they'll just make a generated piece of art on the fly and now they've got this thing working in designer and they don't need me even more than they didn't need me, me last week and i would say not really they were going to use clip art anyway you weren't in this discussion to begin with like you were you were never going to get paid for any of the work being done here so i'm actually kind of excited to see how it works and okay. to be honest the idea of having a browser that i could use secondarily and pop up to do a quick generation of an image that sounds kind of fun edge might get some use for me again so we'll see it might actually increase big use yeah maybe all right. Uh, there are a lot of other announcements. Uh, here are a few more highlights. Uh, Defender Cloud Security Posture Management and Defender for DevOps are new offerings that you can get in Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Now, if you don't know what any of those means, you probably don't care about this. But if you do, they work with GitHub and Azure DevOps to use some algorithms to identify security weaknesses and prioritize fixes, just making it easier to secure a corporate network. Uh, Microsoft Edge is getting workspaces. This is a feature that lets you share a set of Microsoft Edge browser tabs with a project member as a single link. So you send them the link and it opens the files and the websites and everything, and the tabs update in real time as you progress with the project. Uh, the Microsoft Teams App Store is adding an avatars app that'll let you customize an animated avatar that'll show up on video, similar to what Zoom offers. Microsoft Teams Premium is a new tier that offers lots of premium features. <laughs> it's right there in the name, uh, including Intelligent Recap, which can automatically create tasks, chapters, and highlights for a meeting. 
as well as translate uh, captions into 40 languages. Microsoft Places lets you see who's working from where, so you can better plan office use in, in a hybrid world. It includes things like travel time, including traveling within an office. If you're in a really big building, that might be helpful. Uh, Places is coming in beta soon. And finally, Apple TV and Apple Music apps will be available for Windows in the Microsoft Star starting next year. So you won't have to use the web or iTunes for Windows. So long, iTunes for Windows. You're getting an Apple Music app. Uh, the Windows 11 Photo app is also going to add actual iCloud integration. Uh, right now, you can download all your iCloud stuff, uh, but there will be more integration so you can manage it the way you do in iPhoto, except with the Windows 11 Photo app. Nice. I'm excited to get Apple Music on my Series X of all things. I always like having a nice, loud TV running some, you know, cool video while music's playing and just do it from a console. I'm, I don't know. I'm simple that way. So thanks, Apple and Microsoft, for shaking hands. <laughs> for for making making nice with each other. Yep. Uh, all right, real quickly, uh, Stephanie, Rob, and Terrence over on the Tech John talked about this this week. Uh, I've also seen it kicking around elsewhere on the internet, so I thought it deserved a little attention. CNET and Wall Street Journal both reported that the Warren County of Ohio Department of Emergency Services has received about 12 emergency calls from the Kings Island Amusement Park due to the iPhone 14 crash detection going off during a roller coaster ride. Now, the department has dealt with accidental calls when your phone gets squeezed and it automatically triggers emergency. Uh, but these new calls specifically identified a car crash with unknown injuries, so they know it's the crash detection. Wall Street Journal's Joanna Stern noted that similar alerts have been triggered by the Joker roller coaster at Six Flags Great America near Chicago. It's unclear whether those are the squeeze, though, or if they're actually crash detection. My theory on this, Scott, is that Kings Island's roller coaster just is a little jerkier. It's a little maybe less um, uh, proactively stopping your neck from getting whipped around and therefore triggers the crash detection because otherwise they've sold millions of iPhone 14s. We'd be hearing about this at lots of amusement parks and we're really only hearing about it significantly from Kings Island. So yeah. maybe Including maybe we just haven't heard about it yet, but if we don't hear about it from other places, I'm going to think it's the roller coaster at fault, not the iPhone 14. Yeah, if there were a string of stories about Space Mountain or something, then you know we would have heard those by now. I, I agree with you, and I also have a very, I think, what is an elegant solution. On the software slash server slash something level, Apple needs to say, look, if you're in these parks, the, the phone is going to say, hey, it looks like you're entering a place where this can be a little screwy. Do you want to put this on a pause for a day, for a month, for, or, you know, not a month, hopefully you're not there a month, but like 20 minutes or something yeah. so that we don't get false positives or whatever. Just have an option like that. I don't know if they'll do it, but if anything, this is just advertising for this particular Kings Island amusement park and that <laughs> ride. Because if, if you you're don't chasing value these thrills, your spine health, head to exactly. Kings Island. Yeah. yeah, if you're chasing the thrill, I think we got a good idea for you for your next trip. Listen, if we don't see this widespread outside of Kings Island, I think the solution is for Apple to call Kings Island and say, you need to stop your roller coaster from jerking people <laughs> around that hard. It's not good for people. Get it's OSHA showing up there. as a car. Like you could look at this as roller coaster inaccurately sets off car crash, or you can look at it as roller coaster as bad as a car crash. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Either yeah. way, those headlines are bad. And they're bad for Kings Island. Good luck out there. All right, let's check out the mailbag. I uh, got a great email from Jeff here who says, love the show, been listening to Tom and Sarah since the TNT days. I'm a tech guy by trade, but a musician at heart. And I love to often mix the two. As a guitar player, there's a wealth of software and hardware that makes my life more fun and easy. Friday's episode about AI for music creation got me thinking about another use of AI for musicians, guitarists in particular. IK Multimedia's new Tone X capture software lets a guitar player connect a hardware device to their guitar amp, amplifier, and computer, and using pink noise and a series of pre recorded guitar tracks, digitally capture and effectively recreate their favorite amplifier sounds in their computer and then use that in their favorite recording software. So you're you're basically training it. Uh, there's even an iPad and iPhone version covering. The software uses machine learning to analyze the differences between the real amp and the simulation to get it as close as possible. It's a slow process. It requires a very modern computer, but it definitely hints at what's to come in the future. Thanks for your time. Oh no, thank you for your time, Jeff. Uh, that's amazing. I, I, I love that using machine learning to train amplifier noise, you know, atmosphere uh, to replicate it. Very cool. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I love hearing about how machine learning, the, the ways we don't think of machine learning yet coming to to bear, you know, like it's always up to now. It's been, well, we're going to make a bunch of images or we're going to replace artists or we're going to change the way a uh, video is made or whatever. And these are all the obvious ones. Once in a while, something like this pops up like, oh, yeah, machine learning can be applied to so much other stuff. And it makes me excited for the future of this stuff. Yeah. And pink noise is a constant sound in the background. It's not songs by pink no no these are those are diff- those Although, are those are not noise yeah. those are if joy. you kick something over at night like a can i guess that by noise. definition might be pink noise yeah uh well like thank so. you scott johnson uh of course when you kick things over at night it's johnson noise uh what else you got going on well if you'd like some more johnson noise here's the deal i do a show on thursdays called core which uh is a show about video games and we're going to talk a lot about these reviews for the 4090 and what it might mean for PC gamers, along with a ton of other stuff. If you value great conversation uh, and a good time and a lot of laughs around the video game industry, what's happening at the top all the way down to what we're playing, I think you should check out Core. It's at frogpants.com slash core or find it wherever you get your shows. A special thanks to those who support us on Patreon. Uh, If you're a brand new patron, you get shouted out and you get all the cool stuff like the extended show, special episodes, uh, links to the doc at certain level, merchandise, all of that stuff. Uh, But we want to thank our longtime supporters too, BioCal, one of our top lifetime supporters. Thank you for all the years of support, BioCal. BioCal in our chat room right now saying, if pink went goth, would that be black pink noise? You know what? Yes. The in answer your, is yes. The answer is in no your question. area. Black pink in your area. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson and Sarah Lane off of vacation. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>